Let's turn tonight to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Text for the sermon this evening is verses 15 and 16. This is God's word in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who with respect of persons, without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised up him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, And the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. 
And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So far we read the holy and inspired word of God. Let's read the text again. Verses 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue this evening a development of the doctrine of sanctification as it's clearly taught in the Word of God. Last week, Sunday morning, for our Heidelberg Catechism, we made a beginning in developing certain truths regarding sanctification. And what we began with last week, Sunday, was from Lord's Day 32 that we are called to, as God's people, a life of good works. But you'll recall in the introduction to that sermon last week that I said from a certain point of view that wasn't the best place to begin. We did so because we wanted to make progress in the Heidelberg Catechism. But one of the reasons it wasn't the best place to begin is that in the doctrine of sanctification, Good works do not stand at the heart and essence of it. And there are other certain fundamental truths behind the doctrine of good works. Good works, really, we can say, is the evidence or the manifestation of our being sanctified by God. But there are certain more basic truths that must be developed in the doctrine of sanctification. And so though we began with good works, we're coming back now tonight and to the sermons that follow some of those more fundamental ideas relative to sanctification. One of those is taught to us in this text before us tonight. One of the foundational truths of sanctification is that our being sanctified by God and our being called to be holy, as it is found in our text tonight, is rooted and it is grounded in what is true of God Himself. God is a holy God. And because God is a holy God, those whom He saves, He saves unto holiness and calls unto holiness. That is the clear teaching of the text as we have it before us Tonight, in both verses 15 and 16, that main point is set forth. But as He which hath called you is holy. That's the basis of this. Now, out of that comes this. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And then that's rooted in the Old Testament itself, in Leviticus chapter 11, because there it is written, Be ye holy, for I am am holy. What this passage teaches us is that our holiness and our call to holiness is grounded in the very holiness of God Himself. And so we take that tonight as our theme. Continuing our series, Saved by Grace, the theme tonight is sanctification grounded in the holiness of God. Let's see in the first place the importance of holiness in salvation. And that first point will lead into more directly what we have in the text, the meaning of God's holiness. And then, having seen that basis, we'll consider in the last place the calling to be holy in all manner of conversation. The sermon this evening is going to focus on the holiness of God. 
And we could have chosen many passages to teach the truth of the holiness of God. The reason that I chose this passage to consider the holiness of God is that this passage in 1 Peter chapter 1 brings together directly God's holiness with our holiness. Because we're dealing in this series of sermons with the application of the blessings of salvation and what that means for us in our life as we live it before God. There's all kinds of passages that teach the holiness of God. There's all kinds of passages that teach us how we are to live. This is one that brings them together directly. The call to be holy and God's work to make us holy is directly related in our text to what is true of God as a holy God. It struck me as I was developing this part of the series that what we are doing tonight with this sermon is what we could have done with every particular blessing of salvation as we've considered it in the order of salvation. Each particular blessing reveals something about God and flows in a certain sense out of what is true of God Himself. Consider what we've dealt with already in the order of salvation. We've learned about regeneration. God's work to regenerate you is to implant that life of Christ in your heart by the Spirit, making that which was dead alive and uniting by that work you inseparably to the Lord Jesus Christ. That work of regeneration says something about God and flows out of the very being of God. What it teaches us about God is that He is the God of life in the most absolute sense of the word. In Him is all life. He is the living God. The second blessing of salvation we considered in the order of salvation is God's saving work to call you and to call me by His powerful voice. And we took note of that in those sermons about what that teaches us concerning God. What it teaches us about God is that He is the God who speaks. As the living God, He speaks and His speech is always a powerful speech. We considered faith. What faith is. A resting upon, a believing, a trusting in God as He is revealed in Jesus Christ. And that flows back to the being of God Himself. And it reveals to us He is the only One that is trustworthy as He is faithful in all of His promises. Justification taught us all sorts of things about what is true of God. The blessing of justification reveals and flows out of who God is as a righteous God. And therefore, to be accepted by Him, one is to be perfectly righteous as they stand before Him and His law. We've touched on these things directly at times, by implication at other times, in the development of several of this series of the order of salvation. And now we do that explicitly with sanctification. And learn that sanctification is grounded in what is true of God as a holy God. Now it's a legitimate question to ask, why are we doing this more explicitly with this particular blessing of sanctification? We didn't do this with the other aspects of the order of salvation. But we are doing this tonight with sanctification. And the reason for that is expressed in the first point of the sermon, that there is a fundamental importance of holiness in our salvation. And I want to draw that out by two points. And after making the two points, end the first point of the sermon by relating these two points 
and hopefully buy that to see why this is especially significant in God's saving work. This being our holiness is grounded in and flows out of the very holiness of God Himself. So two points to come to that very important conclusion. The first point is this, that the Bible, we can say, very much emphasizes this particular attribute of God, His holiness. Reformed theologians have even said that it is the attribute of attributes. The distinguishing characteristic of the God of the Christian faith is His holiness. And we need to be careful with that. And careful with that simply because God is all of His attributes. But at the same time, we have to recognize that there is something special and significant about the holiness of God in the way that the holiness of God is revealed to us in the sacred Scriptures. And in that regard, let's take note of three things that we can point out generally that shows the emphasis on the holiness of God in the Word that we have before us. In the first place, the Word of God reveals to us the threefold repetition ascribing praise to God as the Holy God. And here we reference two passages in which in the ascription of praise to God, God is revealed as the Holy One. The first passage in this regard is Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 records for us the vision that Isaiah the prophet was given to see of the angels as the angels stood before the holy God. And here we read in verses 2 and 3, as he saw the Lord in verse 1 sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the, the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The threefold repetition that God is holy. Threefold possibly implying that God is triune. This is one example of this. There's a second example of this in Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Now Revelation 4 is also a vision that John sees. And in Revelation 4, he sees the four beasts as they stand before the throne of God. And this is what we read in verse 8 of Revelation 4. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Two passages in Scripture with a threefold repetition. Holy, Holy, Holy. Beloved, that's significant. And that is significant because this characteristic of God's holiness is the only one for which this is true in the Scriptures. God is a God of grace. That's an attribute of God. Fundamental to who God is. Taught all throughout the Bible. But never do we read in the praise of God. Grace, grace, grace. That's not to diminish the grace of God. Don't misunderstand that. But it's to point out that that's not found in the Scriptures. God is a God of love. Even in 1 John with the very significant statement, God is love. 
pointing out something very special about the love of God, but never do we read in the ascribing of worship to Him, love, love, love. There's something special in the exaltation of God that He is the Holy One. As this threefold repetition found twice in the Scriptures, crying out, this is who God is. Holy, holy, holy. That in the first place. In the second place, we take note of the fact that the holiness of God is that which is ascribed to God by the name that is given to Him. Holy is an adjective. Holy describes who God is. But what the Bible does with that adjective is it makes it the very name of God so that in the Scriptures we read that this is who God is. He is the Holy One. In the Old Testament, we repeatedly hear of God being referred that way. It's a theme in the book of Isaiah. So that especially in that book, God is referred to as the Holy One. Or the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of His people. An example of that is in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, where we read simply this, To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, Seth, the Holy One? And I chose that example because that gets really at the idea of holiness. To whom will you liken me? Who is my equal? Says the Holy One. So in the first place, that threefold repetition, holy, holy, holy. In the second place, this is His very name. The Holy One. And then in the third place, consider for example the book of Leviticus. And the reason I call attention to this is that in our text in 1 Peter chapter 1, we read in verse 16, it is written. And the it is written brings us back to the Old Testament where it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And that quotation from 1 Peter 1 verse 16 is found in Leviticus chapter 11. And so we think about the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is an incredibly important book in the Old Testament. And we can fail to understand that at times as New Testament believers who come to the book of Leviticus and often read through it or unfortunately at times skip over it trying to make sense of all of the laws that are taught in the book. But understand the fundamental importance of Leviticus for the Old Testament church and really for unlocking the meaning of the Old Testament in preparation for the new and the coming of Jesus Christ. Leviticus would have been, for example, the catechism curriculum of the children and youth. So important was it to understand what it meant to live life in Israel in the Old Testament. Well, when you look at the book of Leviticus, the theme of the book of Leviticus is Holiness. Holiness of God and the holiness of His people. And the work of God to take a unholy, sinful people and make them holy like unto Himself. So that all of the laws in the first part of the book, and it begins with the sacrifices, of course, which bring us to the Lord Jesus Christ, stand as the basis and the way in which this unholy people approach a holy God and live with that holy God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the whole point of the book of Leviticus, captured in our text in verse 16 is that God is holy and you must be holy. And this is the way of holiness. This is the basis of holiness. It's the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what we read in that quotation 
from Leviticus chapter 11. I'd actually like to read the fuller quotation. We have the very brief sentence, Be ye holy, for I am holy. But this is the context in which that is found. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. Where we read this, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. The main first point is to say that the holiness of God is an especially important aspect of who God is as that is revealed in the way in which we just described it from the Scriptures. We follow that with the second main point that we will then relate to the first main point in a moment. The second main point is that the very purpose of God in your salvation and in mine, is to make you holy. The very goal of God, the very end of God in His work of salvation, is to make you, an unholy, guilty sinner, holy like He is holy. Why did He elect you? To the end that you would be holy. Why did Jesus Christ come and die on that cross? To the end that you would be holy. Why is the Spirit worked in your heart? So that the goal would be accomplished of your holiness. Why upon death will the sinful nature finally be abolished so that you will live with God in perfect holiness in heaven? The end, the purpose, the goal of all of God's saving work in Jesus is that you might be holy. And there are passages in the Word of God that speak that way and call our attention to how that is what God had had His eye on in His saving work of you in the Lord Jesus Christ. That does not diminish in any way the fundamental importance of justification at all. They all go together. And recall the very important point that we made last week. That that holiness which is the end or goal could not take place apart from justification because the basis of our sanctification is that God has justified us with the imputed righteousness of Christ so that being justified, God goes on to accomplish that goal of your sanctification so that you are holy with the holiness of Christ. I'm going to read now four passages. Four passages that show us how the end or the goal of God's saving work is exactly what we are up to in this series, namely, holiness. The first passage is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Ephesians 1, 3 and 4. This is where we actually began the series of sermons in a study of election. And we did not treat this part of it, but notice what we have in verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. That, very important word, this is the purpose of it that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. He elected you in Christ in eternity to the end that this would be true of you. Holy and without blame. Stay in the book of Ephesians. 
Flip over to chapter 5 if you're following along. Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is the chapter on marriage. Marriage as it's grounded in the marriage of Christ and His church. This is what we read in verses 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. That's the cross. Redemption. The shedding of His blood for His people. That Same word, purpose, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Why did Jesus die on the cross? Why did he shed his blood? So that you would be washed so that you would be purified, so that you would be sanctified and be presented to God as a holy people. It's the very purpose, not only of election, but of the very cross of Jesus. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 22. And 21, 21 and 22. We read this, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death. Why? To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Same idea. And then one more passage, Titus 2. Titus 2, 13 and 14. Titus 2, 13 and 14. It says this, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself, that sanctification, purify a peculiar people zealous of good works. Love it, all of this is to say, that the very purpose of God's electing, redeeming, saving work in Jesus is that we are holy. These two basic points, fundamentally important points, come together. The point that God is a holy God emphasized in the Scriptures. And the point that you and I as the body of Christ are made holy as the very purpose of God in salvation come together in one word. Covenant. Covenant, which is fellowship. So that the basic idea is this. God as a holy God is a covenant God who takes a sinful and guilty people and draws them unto Himself. And how can God, who is a holy God, dwell with a people. What must be true of them? This is what must be true of them. They must be holy like He is holy. The end of your holiness is that you might fellowship with the holy God into all eternity in the new heaven and new earth with Jesus Christ. Because God is holy We must be holy. And in that holiness, we dwell with in covenant fellowship with Jehovah God. That's the connection. And that's why the holy God sent Jesus Christ to redeem us from our sin so that we would be righteous legally before Him. The basis of which you be holy as God is holy, 
and thus dwell with Him into all eternity in the perfect work of Jesus. That's the connection. And that's the fundamental importance of holiness in salvation. Now we consider the holiness of God. What it is that God is a holy God. The passage teaches that very clearly. But as He which hath called you is holy, and then in the second part, for I am holy. The holiness of God is that attribute of God according to which He is eternal and absolute perfection. And that perfection reveals itself in that He is separated from all that is sinful and defiled, and He is consecrated to Himself as the highest good. Absolute, eternal perfection. Perfection that shows itself in being separated from sin and consecrated to God. The word holy in our text describing God and what must be true of you and me has as its basic idea separation. Holiness is separation. And from that basic idea of separation come all of the main elements of the holiness of God. And so let's run through those main elements. There are three of them. In the first place, the holiness of God is His consecration to Himself. That's where we start when we think about the holiness of God, and it's probably not the first thing that we think of when we think of holiness. The first thing that we probably think of with holiness is in connection with sin and to be free from or separated from sin. But really, the most basic idea of holiness is consecration to God. And God is the highest good. And so for God to be holy, it means that He is devoted and consecrated to Himself because Himself is the highest good in all of reality. You have to remember that this is an attribute of God which means that it's true of Him eternally. God has always been a holy God. God is a holy God apart from the reality of sin as it's present in this world. And so before the heavens and the earth were made, before through Adam sin was introduced into this world, God was a holy God. Because the basic idea of holiness is that of consecration to the highest good. And the highest good is Himself as God. The second aspect of the holiness of God also flowing out of the idea of separation, is that negative point. It is the separation from what is defiled and sinful. And that's really the emphasis in 1 Peter 1. It's talking about our calling to be holy. In the verse prior to our text, we read, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Sin. And then it goes on and says, now be holy, because God is holy. And so the emphasis here is on the holiness of God as that which is separated from sin. God as a holy God is pure light. Darkness is the metaphor in Scripture for sin. Light is the metaphor in Scripture for purity. Holiness. And we read in the Scriptures, in Him is no darkness at all. We can hardly fathom this aspect of the holiness of God. He's perfect. Ethically perfect. Never an impure thought. Never an unholy word. Never an unrighteous act. Everything about God is free from the defilement and the corruption of that which is sinful and evil. He truly is perfectly good. 
And with that idea of separation, separation so that he's consecrated to himself and free from all defilement of sin is the third aspect of the holiness of God which comes through in both Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4 in those doxologies of praise and that is the transcendence of God above everything else. When we ascribe to God that He is the holy God, when we cry out with the angels and with those four beasts, holy, 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 we are saying by that, not only is there no sin in Him, but we are saying by that that He is the exalted, transcendent, magnified God above all things. That's the holiness of God. Very briefly. And to add to that description of the holiness of God, we can see from the passage that the holiness of God is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. The manifestation of God as a holy God is seen in the person and in the work of Jesus. Exactly in the three points that we just made, describing God as a holy God. God's holiness is His perfect devotion and consecration to Himself as the highest good. And what was true of Jesus the moment that He came to this earth was that He was devoted and consecrated to God. In the Old Testament, the priest would wear all of those garments that God told him he must wear, each having their significance, each that the people would see in order to have pictures for them of what is true of the High Priest, Jesus Christ. And on the headpiece of that High Priest as he walked among the people were the words, holiness to the Lord. Meaning that this man's job was to be consecrated to God and to consecrate the people to the holy and living God of Israel. But every priest in the Old Testament who had that holiness to the Lord was an imperfect, sinful type. Because the reality is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He came to this earth. And He came, as we read in the Scriptures, to do God's will. He came completely devoted and consecrated to His heavenly Father. He said in John 17, Glorify Thy Son so that Thy Son might glorify Thee. His singular purpose in everything He thought, in everything He said, in everything He did was to be consecrated To God, His Father. The holiness of Jesus is revealed also in His separation from sin. He is, as 1 Peter 1 says, the Lamb without blemish. He is the holy thing that was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Spirit who is the Holy Spirit, freeing Him and preserving Him from the corruption of Adam which is passed down to every man. So that all of His life long, never an impure thought, never an unholy word, never an unrighteous act, truly, perfectly, of Himself, separated from every defilement, corruption, and sin. And those two parts of the holiness of God revealed in Jesus Christ come to the foreground on the cross of Calvary. It was on the cross where we see complete devotion to His Father in doing His will by giving Himself for His bride. On that cross we see His perfect freedom from sin and defilement making Him and Him alone the one 
qualified and able to take your sin and my sin upon Him. And on that cross, He bore the wrath of God because the wrath of God is the manifestation that this is who God is. The holy God who hates sin and punishes sin. And from that work on the cross, now this is true of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the One who sits at God's right hand, transcendent above and exalted above all other creatures. So that at His feet, we will bow and we will worship as the express image of God's brightness. And as the One who is the manifestation of the triune God Himself. The holiness of God is revealed in Jesus Christ. And understanding that to be the holiness of God, we hear then the call that comes to us because God is holy, be ye holy. And to reiterate the point that we made earlier, be ye holy because this is what it means to be part of the very family of the living God. Notice what Peter writes at the beginning of this section in verse 14. As obedient children, we are the children of the living God. We are children because we have been adopted into the covenant family through the work of Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven comes to us as our Father who is holy and says, this is what it means to be part of my family. Just like what it means to be in our own families. In our own homes is to walk as we are called to walk according to His Word. God as our Holy Father says, you are my children. And as my children, now this is what is to be true of you. Be ye holy. And beloved, your holiness and my holiness is exactly that which must be patterned after what is true of the holiness of God. In those two main points, separated, separated, separated by being consecrated to God, separated by being delivered from all defilement and pollution. So that your holiness and my holiness as we go forth in obedience to this text is to be devoted to God in your heart, in your words, in your life, and in that devotion to God to run away from, turn from, and be kept from the ways of sin and the ways of evil. Does it sound familiar? It sounds familiar to us. Because this is the very idea that we expressed in the sermon this morning on the mortification of the old man and the quickening of the new man. And we notice from the text the all-encompassing nature of this holiness to which we are called. The all-encompassing nature as it comes through when it says, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The word conversation there, not as we use it, just to refer to what we say with our mouths and our talking with each other, but conversation, meaning the whole of our life. God says, I'm the holy God. You're part of my family. This is what it means to live in my family. In all of your life, be holy. Be holy in what holiness is. Not just an outward legalistic do's and don'ts, but a heart that's devoted to me as your God and the desire to be separated in our heart and in our life from all corruption. 
all manner of conversation, beloved. Everything in our life. Holy as husbands. Holy as wives. Holy as parents. Holy as children. Holy in our entertainment. Holy when we go to work. Holy when we date. Holy when we marry. Holy when we are elderly. Holy in how we die. Holy in how we endure hardship. Holy in everything. That's the Word of God that comes to us from the One who is the Holy God Himself. And just briefly take note of one other connection as it's found in 1 Peter 1. The passage is all about being a pilgrim. And Peter was writing to saints going through trials. And earlier in the passage, it talks about the trials of our faith. The trials of our faith which are like gold and silver that must be refined by fire. And God uses that to make us holy and to grow in our life of holiness as our faith is purified and strengthened through the hardships of this life. God uses that to conform us more and more in the image of Jesus Christ. Approach the trials from that point of view. As we go through those hardships. May our prayers be, God, use this to refine me. God, use this to devote me more and more to Thee. Because every trial does that. Every trial leads us to live more and more loosely to this earth. This isn't our home. God is who I need in all things. And Lord, more and more make me separate from the corruption of this world that I am so drawn to, so that as our faith is strengthened, we are led to be holy as God is holy. And beloved, this is commanded, and this is possible. It's commanded to us. The Word of God is a command. Be ye holy. And we receive it tonight as a command. And just very briefly, we're going to talk more about this in later sermons, but we introduce it now. That does not contradict in any way, shape, or form the fundamental truth of the entirety of this series and in the entirety of the Word of God, which is that salvation is God's work. Sanctification is God's work. He makes us holy. He purifies us. He works in us by His Spirit so that we are a holy people. And 1 Peter 1 itself teaches that. The first couple of verses. Verse 2 in particular. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. The Spirit sanctifies. Verse 22 as well. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. God calls us to be holy. We're active in responding to that call. And the way to understand that is very simple. That in God's work to sanctify us, God's work in us by His Spirit, He so causes us as we hear the command as we have it in this text such that we ourselves are active, vigorously active as we desire and as we strive looking to that God and looking to Jesus Christ to be as we exclaimed it in the text and in the sermon more and more devoted to Him and more and more separated from sin. As God works in us holiness, He causes us to be active in the response to hearing this Word and in the desire to be a holy people like God is holy. As I said, more on that in sermons to come. 
And we conclude by saying not only is it possible, not only is it commanded, but it's possible. The possibility of your holiness and my holiness is really the point that we just made. God makes us holy. God works that in us. As we talked about earlier, the fruit and the purpose of the saving work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary as His life has worked in us. And that life being the life of Christ our holiness by the Spirit. But the possibility is right in the text itself. In the very description of God, you have the possibility of our going forth as holy with the holiness of God. The description of God is this, as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. That's who God is, and that's what He's done. He's called you. We expounded that earlier in the series. He called you. He called you out of darkness into light. He called you out of death into life. And that's the possibility. Now with the life of Christ in me and His holiness, To go forth truly, not just in a legalistic obedience to do's and don'ts, but a true life of holiness. The true life of holiness being devotion and consecration to God and separation from sin. On this side of the grave, still polluted, Requiring, therefore, daily the sanctifying grace and covering of Jesus Christ and His blood. And one day, to be perfected. To be perfected when that old man is gone. And we will dwell with God as a holy people. With the holy God Himself. Revealed in the holy Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in Heaven, we confess Thee to be again in praise and worship the Holy God. And we're thankful that Thou hast been pleased in Thy saving work to make us holy and to call us to holiness. And we pray that we might hear that this evening and that we would desire out of love and thanks to Thee to be holy in all manner of conversation. Bless thy word as it was preached. May it be a word that has been faithful to thee into the sacred scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.